Hi, I'm a taco. Hey, happy Halloween week. I hope you had a great time yesterday at Halloween. I hope you're in your costume right now because we are going to have so much fun. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> How many taco jokes can I work in today? Who knows? Why am I a taco? You guys who have been here at Kids Church for a little bit know that this is my absolute most favorite food uh, of all time. Heaven is going to be full of tacos and I'm going to be so happy to be with Jesus forever and eating tacos forever. They won't even make me fat. So let's get going this morning. We want to not just talk about tacos, but we want to worship God. We want to sing to God. And there's no better way to do that than to get up off your couches, your chairs, your futons, your bed, whatever you're watching this on, and get moving. We're going to have our theme song, Relentless, kicking down in just a second. Relentless is all about how God's love for us is relentless. That means it never, ever, ever stops. We can never do anything that causes God to stop loving us, and we will never do anything that stops God from uh, pursuing a relationship with us. He wants to be our friends, and he wants us to show love to him. Relentless, here we go. Salvation sounds a new beginning Begin believing Redemption's bid is on
Well, welcome back. I, I didn't know, but it's hard to dance in a taco costume. Imagine that. How is your dancing at home? Well, hey, we want to get things kicked off here now that we've sung a little bit. Now we've got some worldwide uh, trivia questions to ask you. Because here at Goodman's Global Games, it's all about two things. One is countries from all around the world getting together to compete. And the second is Olympic-style activity, Olympic-style competition. So we want to quiz you on your knowledge of things all around the world, plus uh, sports competition. So here we go with question number one. Dodgeball has never been a part of the Olympic Games. Ah, oh. but a new sport involved hitting people was added to the games in the 2012 Olympics in London, England. What sport was it? Is it A, hockey, B, women's boxing, or C, American football? Hmm, your answer in three, two, one. It is, I kind of did this, I can tipped it a little bit. Women's boxing, women's boxing was added to the Olympics for the first time. Go women's boxing. All right, here we go. Second question. What country has the record for the most snowfall in one year? Is it A, Canada, B, Greenland, or C, the United States? Your answer in three, two, one. If you guessed Canada, you'd be wrong. I would have thought it'd be someone way up north in Canada where only polar bears live, but it is the United States. In 1998, Mount Baker, Washington, in one year had 95 feet of snow. 95 feet. That's insane in one year. Wow. It's a lot of shoveling. Can you imagine shoveling all that? Yikes. All right, here we go. Question number three. What country is also the world's largest island? Is it A, Greenland, B, Japan, or C, Australia? Your answer in three, two, one. I would have got this one wrong too. I've got the right answers here in front of me, but I would have guessed Australia. No, not Australia. It's Greenland. Greenland is the world's largest island. Go Greenland. All right, here we go. Question four. In 2012, the largest manufacturing company in the world uh, measured by revenue, so how much stuff they sold, was a Japanese, uh, Japanese company. What product do they manufacture? Do they uh, manufacture phones? Is it Samsung? Do they manufacture TVs? Is it Hitachi? Or do they manufacture cars? Is it Toyota? This is probably going to be a guess for all of us. I, I'm guessing we don't stay up at night and study uh, Japanese companies and their revenue. But your answer in three, two, one. It's Toyota. Toyota, the largest manufacturing company in the entire world. Uh, and of course they make cars. Go Toyota. I'm saying go a lot of things. I don't know why I'm doing that. All right, last question. The NDL, or National Dodgeball League, yes, that's a thing, is the only professional dodgeball league in the United States. What state is it based in? Is it A, Mississippi, B, South Dakota, or C, the state that I moved here from, Minnesota? All right, your answer in three, two, one. It is C, Minnesota. I guess it's just so cold in Minnesota all the time. They just need to stay indoors and throw dodgeballs at each other. How many did you get right? This was a really, really, really tough quiz this week. All right, well, we've sung a little bit. We've answered questions. I'm betting you're getting a picture of what sport we're talking about today. And now we need to sing and worship God one more time. So get ready, get up, get ready to shout it out.
not get any easier to sing and dance in a taco costume. How's your costumes doing at home? A bit comfy? Are you like taking off hats and masks and stuff yet? Where are you at? Well, I think you're really going to love today's event. It is one of my absolute favoritest games ever. And if you couldn't guess from a couple of the questions in our Trivial Worldwide review, it is dodgeball. Who was a fan of playing dodgeball? All right, I'm going to tell you a little secret about me. When I was younger, I was always the smallest and the slowest kid in any class that I was in. How many dodgeballs do you think I took to the face? Ooh, I love dodgeball, but I don't have great memories of it when I was a kid. It is a very fun game, but it can also be a very intense game. And right now, I think it's time for us to check in with our friends Rick Rexworth and Hank Happy with their coverage of Goodman's Global Games. And that means dodgeball. Maybe we'll even see what Coach Locke is up to. Take it away. Hello again, and welcome again to our coverage of Goodman's Global Games. Again, I'm Rick Rexworth. And next to me, as usual, is Hank Happy. No, 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 no. No, you are Hank Happy. No, I'm Hank Happy. Yes, sir. Well, the games continue here at Goodman Arena, and today is a crowd favorite. Cotton candy! Sorry, Hank, I was going to say dodgeball. The game today is dodgeball. Nope, it's got candy. Good one, Hank, but I think that's just cut. Just gonna dig right in, are ya? All right, well, by now, most teams are probably finalizing their strategies for the dodgeball tournament later today. We'll see you sideline <laughs> at game time. <laughs> Coach, what's our strategy for dodgeball? What's the plan? What do we do? Hey, it's a surprise, and I think y'all are going to love it. But right now, y'all head out to that dodgeball court. Y'all get warmed up. I'll see you soon. Yes, sir. <laughs> you got it, Coach. I can't wait to hear the plan. Oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> hey, Coach, uh, uh, what's with the oil and water there? Are you planning some kind of science experiment? Hey, I guess you could say that. I'm actually testing out an old theory on how to dominate the competition in dodgeball. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Well, uh, what are you planning? Well, I looked over some old records and seems there's this one coach who led his team to victory after victory in dodgeball. Well, his name was Tim Marquis, and he had a foolproof method for winning every single game. Uh, hold on. Uh, I remember Tim Marquis and his method yeah, for winning. Yeah, it was brilliant. First, he would take water and put it inside his team's dodgeballs, making them really heavy. So if you got hit with one, you got knocked clean off your feet. Yeah, uh, the problem, see, is... But that's is... not all. See, he would take the other team's dodgeballs, and he coated them in oil, okay? So they couldn't even pick them up. Tim Marquis' team couldn't lose. So I'm taking Tim Marquis' method with oil and water. We're going to carry Team Blue to dodgeball victory. Here's to you, Tim Marquis. Okay, hold on just a minute, though. This oil and water method you're talking about is cheating. You can't seriously be considering doing this. Well, of course I am. It worked for Tim Marquis, and it's gonna work for Team Blue. I came to win, Janitor. Hey, no, seriously, Coach, don't do this, okay? Tim got in a lot of trouble, and you will too. Oh, right, yeah. Tim Marquis got in trouble for winning too many dodgeball games. Right, hmm, yeah. See what I did right there? That's an argumentative tactic called sarcasm where I make fun of your point of view, therefore making your point of view seem silly and or humorous. The point is, I got a team to get ready for a victory, so if you'll please excuse me. Hold on, coach, hold on. Before you leave, you need to watch something, all right? What? Just let me pull up this video real quick. It's about uh, Tim Marquis and oh, okay. his now we're method. 
Uh, I think you need to check this out before you go. Hey, okay, go ahead. Let's watch all Timmy in action. Okay, just hit play. One of the darker chapters of Goodman's Global Games came years ago with the supposed dodgeball winning streak of coach Tim Marquis. His team wowed the crowds with their incredibly powerful throws and high scoring performance. And while Tim's team played amazingly well, opposing teams could barely pick up the dodgeballs. But why? The answer? Oil and water. Game officials discovered that Tim Marquis had been cheating all along. He gave his own players an unfair advantage by filling their dodgeballs with water and sabotaged the other teams by covering their dodgeballs with oil. Tim Marquis' dodgeball medals and trophies were taken away, and Tim was never allowed to coach at the Global Games again. Tim Marquis. Any of you guys remember our series that we had kind of towards the beginning of the summer called Super Sports Spectacular? Because I, I remember that Tim Marquis guy, he did not give very good advice at all. Well, what do you think Coach Locke is going to do here? Do you think he's going to go with the Tim Marquis method? Or do you think he's going to learn how to be a better leader and figure out how to, you know, lead and coach his team? Well, we'll check back in with Coach Locke and Team Blue in a little bit. But you know what would help him out a whole lot is if he understood today's main point. You come to think about it, today's main point is going to help you understand more about how to be the leader God designed you to be, too. So let's see what that main point is. I will follow good leaders. It is a great main point. We need to taco about it more. Oh, another taco joke. But first, we need to repeat that main point together. I will follow good leaders on the count of three. One, two, three. I will follow good leaders. Great job on that. This is a really important main point. Clearly, we should follow good leaders instead of choosing to follow bad leaders or follow no one at all. But that leaves us with a question, how do we know if a leader is a good leader? Well, the short answer to that is a good leader helps others do what God designed them to do. So if someone tries to get you to do something that you know God does not want you to do, that person is not being a very good leader. They might be a good, uh, okay person. They might be a good friend. They might be a good leader in certain situations, but they're not being a good leader right then. So it means if one of your friends tries to get you to be mean to someone else, you shouldn't follow your friend because he is not being a good leader right then. Being mean is wrong, and a, a good leader wouldn't want you to do that. If a coach tells you you should skip church to go to an extra practice, then that coach is not being a good leader, at least right then. Good leaders know that going to church is important. Choosing to follow good leaders can help you avoid a whole lot of trouble because a bad leader won't bring you anything but trouble. Now, there's a lesson in the Bible where some people chose to follow a bad leader, a horrific leader, a stupendously awful leader, and his name is Abimelech, who has a bad name too, I guess. The story can be found, guess what, in the book of Judges, where we've been walking through in this whole series, and he's in chapter 9. Let's hear that lesson, but first, some pregame coverage with our friends, Nikki Truman, Johnny Timms, and Tony Platon. Hi, this is Nikki Truman with the GGG Network, and this week's leadership tip is sponsored by Roundabout Roadmaps. If you're having trouble knowing which way to go, pick up a Roundabout Roadmap to clearly see the right direction. All right, gentlemen. Well, you know, in the wake of what happened last week where the GGG snorkeling team just suddenly just split up, and I mean, half the team was even suspended. I know. It was a surprise, no doubt. It I was. still can't believe it. So based on that, I think we should just jump right into this week's Bible footage, and hopefully afterwards it'll really just open up the conversation yeah, to discuss this controversial event. All right, let's check it out. Well, welcome back. And before we jump into Judges chapter 9 and hear the sad story of Abimelech, 
let's go ahead and take another look at our intro video to the book of Judges and remember what this incredible book is all about. The book of Judges. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. Well, let's jump into that book of Judges and hear the sad tale of this guy named Abimelech. Hey, I bet this is the first time you've ever had a taco tell you the Bible story. Well, in our last kids' church experience, I told you about Gideon and how he used his wisdom and his words to keep peace. And after God's great victory over the Midianites, the Israelites lived in peace for the next 40 years. But then Gideon died. And guess what happened? You've got it. Once again, the people turned away from God, did what was evil in God's sight, and began worshiping this little statue guy named Baal. That's really hard to, hard to understand, isn't it? Well, when Gideon was alive, he had 72 sons. 72. That is a lot of kids. It's a lot of diapers. Well, 70 of them were born before a woman from the town of Shechem gave Gideon a son who they named Abimelech. And then... There was another son born after Abimelech, and his name was Jotham, who was the youngest of all the kids. Well, this story centers around Abimelech and a mistake that he made. One day, Abimelech went to his uncles in Shechem with a plan. See, Abimelech wanted to be a king, but he knew he wouldn't be a king as long as his 70 older brothers were alive. So he went and told his relatives in Shechem that he alone should be the ruler, not he and his 70 half-brothers. Oh, wait a minute. I, I thought he had 71 brothers. There were 71? Why didn't he say 71? Well, I'm guessing that Jotham the youngest was too young at the time to even be considered a ruler. But anyways, the important part of this is that the people should have known better and not listened to Abimelech. They should have remembered that Gid what Gideon had said when they asked him to be their king. He here's what he said. I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. Well, Gideon knew that people should only look to God as their king. I mean, he was the only one worthy, and he was the one who gave them that great victory over the Midianites. Yet, here they are just a few years later, and the people are once again thinking about having a dude as their ruler rather than God. And guess what the people decided when Abimelech asked, can I be your king? They said, yeah, sure. And that's when the trouble started. Abimelech immediately gathered together a group of troublemakers. They went to a town called Orphra, and they killed Abimelech's older brothers, all 70 of them. They did not kill Jotham, the youngest. He escaped. And after he had done this horrible thing, he had all his people gather. And when they did, they made Abimelech their king. Because that's who you want as your king, right? A mass murderer. But as they were making Abimelech their king, Jotham climbed up on a hill and he yelled down to them, reminding them about Gideon. And he said, Have you treated Gideon with the honor he deserves for all he accomplished? For he fought for you and risked his life when he rescued you from the Midianites. But today you revolted against my father and his descendants killing his 70 sons on one stone. And you have chosen a slave woman's son, Abimelech, to be your king just because he is your relative. 
Well, the answer was obviously no. They had not honored Gideon. And Jotham went on later to say, May fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leading citizens of Shechem. And may fire come out from the citizens of Shechem and devour Abimelech. And that is exactly what happened. Three years later, trouble stirred up between Abimelech and the people of Shechem. Imagine that. And through some very troubling events, most of the people of Shechem were killed by Abimelech. And Abimelech was killed when he had a stone dropped on his head from a woman up in a tower. Now, what can we learn from this story about leadership? Well, the most important point is that we need to be careful who we follow. The people of Shechem, they should have known better than to follow Abimelech. But instead of turning to God as their king, they made this dude, who turned out to be incredibly evil, their king. And then went and killed all of the sons of Gideon. We need to know about the people we choose to follow before we follow them. Talk to others. Learn about their character. See how they act. We call it the fruit of someone's life. Do they love Jesus? Do they follow him? If they are honorable, they may deserve to lead us. If they're dishonorable, we should never follow them. So do you guys see any similarities between this lesson and then what happened with the snorkeling team? If you're referring to half of the snorkeling team following poor leadership, then yes, I do. All right, so so you guys are pretty close to the situation. Uh, tell me what happened. What happened? Bobby <sighs> Wilhite is what happened. Oh. It, it, okay, it's a sad story all mm. the way around. I mean, this kid, so much potential, and I mean, his life is an absolute train wreck. Ooh. And what really frustrates me, people have been trying for years and years to help this kid out. And I mean, he's just, he doesn't learn. Uh-oh. Yeah, doesn't listen. Good. Problem is, he's the best snorkeler on the mm. GGG team. Yeah, but just because he's a really good snorkeler doesn't mean he's a good leader. Right, obviously, Johnny but half the team didn't know that. What do you mean by that? Well, what he's talking about was there is a major disagreement between Bobby and the captain of the snorkeling team, all right? Mm -hmm. So the night before the big meet, I, it's unbelievable. They're all staying out late. Uh -oh. Yeah, Bobby wanted to break curfew because the coach wasn't gonna arrive until the next day, but the captain of the team said no. Oh, so when the captain said no, what happened next? Half the team followed Bobby. Mm -hmm. After all, he is the star of the team, and half the team stayed back with the captain. Whew. I mean, here's the thing. Little did they know, the coach got an early flight home, so guess what? Oh. He arrived that night. Yeah. And the rest was history. Uh. The half that went with Bobby got suspended, and the whole team suffered. I mean, you've got to be careful who you follow, right? I mean, just because a person is really good, they're really talented, they're popular, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you should follow them, and especially if they're doing wrong stuff. True, but how do you know? If it's right or wrong, right. easy. If it's something that God would want you to do, then you follow that person. If it's not, then yeah. you don't. Mm, well, those are definitely some great words of wisdom right there. We're all out of time for today. So uh, on behalf of Tony and Johnny, this is Nikki Truman and your GGG Leadership Tip of the Week. And we'll see you next time. Okay, so Yeah, man. Well, that was an awful story. Abimelech might be the worst leader I've ever heard of. There's a few others in the Bible that kind of rival him, but man, he was bad. The people never should have chosen to follow him. And by the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. Whenever someone new comes into your life that could be a leader, Remember the story of Abimelech and think carefully about who they are before you decide to follow them. Well, I think it's about time to check back in with Coach Locke. What decision is he going to make? Is he going to go the Tim Marquis route or is he going to do the right thing? Let's see. See? Whoa, they never let him coach after that. That's right. And we'll never know how his team might have done had they competed with honesty. Look, Coach, don't make the same mistake Tim Marquis did. Trust me, it will be better for everyone if you and your team go out and compete with honesty. Mm, this is a tough one. Who do I follow? Tim Marquis or the janitor? Oil and water or fair play? 
Do I go for the sure win with cheating, or do I risk everything by playing by the rules? You've done great in the game so far, Coach. Don't mess it up now by following the wrong leader. You know, back in the Bible, a bunch of people decided to follow this guy called Abimelech. Now, he did terrible things, but people chose to follow him anyway. But in the end, everyone ended up regretting it. Now, I don't want that same thing to happen to you. Hey, you're right, Janitor. Team Blue doesn't cheat. I guess I need to go talk to the team about a new game plan. Hey, you got any ideas? Oh, well, it's dodgeball, so dodging's important. Hey, um, that's great, J-Man. Thanks a lot. Let's go, Team Blue. OK, uh, later, Coach. Good luck. Welcome back, Global Games fans. The dodgeball tournament has been intense, and it all comes down to the final two players. Me and you, dodgeball! Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 it's not you and me playing dodgeball. Hank, I'm talking about the last player from Team Orange and the last player from Team Blue. Now, Team Blue has done a phenomenal job of dodging during this tournament, but it all comes down to this final face-off. We wait for the referee to give them the signal to start, and there's the signal. Both players have acquired a dodgeball and are ready to throw. Team Orange finds a spot, and there's the throw! Team Blue dodges! What a move! There's the throw by Team Blue, and it connects! Team Blue wins the dodgeball tournament, and the crowd is going wild! What a game! It's not over yet! Ouch! Oh, well, you got me there, good buddy! I win! And Team Blue, led by Coach Locke, is the winner of the dodgeball tournament. No, nope, it was me! Sure thing, buddy! Well, congratulations, Team Blue. Put it down. Put it down. From all of us in studio, good game and good day. Bye! Ah! Hey, Coach, congratulations. Team Blue wins again. Yep, I think we did it fair and square. No cheating or dirty tricks. I sure am glad I listened to you, Jenner. You know, things could have been really bad if I'd followed Tim Marquis. <laughs> well, uh, I'm proud of you, Coach. Any chance you'll follow my advice again and not give yourself a cooler shower. Oh, I almost forgot. Hey, thanks, Jenner. I would have forgotten if you hadn't said anything. No, no, no. Woo! <laughs> thanks again, Jenner. Now, time for me to go congratulate the team. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why tiny plastic bricks? Well, I thought you might want something fun to play with. Have fun, big guy. <laughs> Let's go, Team Blue. Woo! Whew. I am relieved that Coach Locke did not follow Tim Marquis. No one should ever follow Tim Marquis. If he had, he would have been caught for cheating, maybe thrown out of the games. It might have been the end of Coach Locke's coaching career. Maybe could have been the end of Team Blue. Who we choose to follow as a leader can have far-reaching consequences, both positive and negative. Remember that the next time you're deciding who to follow, good leaders choose to do what God designed us to do. And by the way, since you were designed to be a leader, you should be living out the things that God designed you to do so that people can follow you as a good leader. I also want you to remember this great verse from the Bible. Well, the letter to the Hebrews is found in the New Testament of our Bible, and it was written by Someone, some people think there's some guys who wrote it. Some people think there's a woman who wrote it. Whoever it was, they were a follower of Jesus. And they wrote it to help churches understand how to live the way God designed them to live. And in that book, they, they lay out all of these leaders from the Old Testament of their Bible. And they said, look at all these people who live for God. And then they said, think about the leaders that you've known in your life who taught you about Jesus. And they say, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the examples of their faith. Now this verse tells us that good comes from the lives of leaders who know the word of God. The word of God is just another word for the Bible. 
So this phrase is telling us to follow leaders who follow God because good comes from their lives. And also, like I just said, it, it means that you should know the Bible and you should have good things coming out of your life so that you can be the good leader that others follow. Good will come from our lives when we know the Word of God and when we follow good leaders. Well, it's been a fantastic day here at Goodman's Global Games, but we're not done quite yet. It's time for our review game, and if any of you ever hope to compete in Goodman's Global Games, we need to get you ready. It's time for some Goodman's Challenging Cool Down Challenge. We're going to have six questions for you. After each of those questions, there's going to be a 30-second timer. I want you to get up, and I want you to plank for 30 seconds in between questions. That'll get you ready to compete in the games. Here we go.
Well, good answers and good training, my friends, to help us remember what we learned today. Let's say our main point one last time. I will follow good leaders. Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. I will follow good leaders. Well, I've got a couple of quick announcements for you before I say goodbye. Uh, and you got to listen to me because I'm a taco. All right, we've got a Christmas box challenge happening. I've challenged you guys to come up with 60 Operation Christmas Child boxes. They'll be distributed all over the world. And I've got a story to share with you today. Oh, I should probably tell you the prize. Glitter beard. Not in the taco costume, though. This is too nice. I got a story to share with you today about someone who received one of these Operation Christmas Child boxes. His name is Carabo, and his story is powerful. Take a listen. I've had a lot of people tell me I'm lucky, but I tell them I'm chosen. My name is Karabo Maretlani. I was born in Lesotho, Southern Africa, and was raised in the villages. When I was about five years old, I lost my father. And not long after my father's death, my mother left me at my grandmother's house and I never saw her for years. So my grandmother became a mother. She told me a lot of things, including how to read and write. But most importantly, she told me about God. Loneliness in my life began when I lost my grandma, the woman who raised me. I had to say goodbye to my love, you know, to my grandmother. Then a year after my grandma's passing, my mother also passed away. I was faced with the sad reality of being an orphan, which is something that I dreaded the most. I had a home and a house in the villages, but I had no parents. I was alone. My uncle brought me into his home in the city. It was there in the city that I I met a friend, actually, who invited me to a church. There was a truck filled with his shoeboxes. I received a shoebox myself. And I remember that shoebox filled one of the holes in my heart, and that was the hope of having something that belonged to me. I had lost everything, so the gift of the box gave me that hope this belongs to me and it really filled my heart. I realized God gave me what I was always in need of. I made a choice to personally seek him. Today I have a family and I'm no longer an orphan. I know I'm chosen. Someone took their time to work hard and to pack my shoebox and God used them to give me hope and to feel what my heart was in need of. So today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I'm asking you to go prepare a gift today. Take a shoebox, give someone hope, and love somebody today, and spread the gospel. Well, Carabo's story reminds me why we do this. We don't do this uh, just to get me in a glitter beard, although that's a nice prize in and of itself. We don't do this to make us feel maybe less guilty because we have a lot and some people have little. We do this to share Jesus' love with people uh, all over the world. We should share Jesus' love with every person that we meet, all of our friends at school, all of our neighbors, all of our cousins. But People all over the world, we have a chance to impact them too. So I want to challenge you to do exactly what Carabo challenged you to do. Pack a shoebox. You can bring it to Kids Church. We'll be collecting those through November 15th, so the next two weeks after this. And for the next two weeks, we'll also have a contact-free drive through in the front of the parking lot uh, before Kids Church starts. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, from 10 to 10.30, we'll have someone out there to grab a shoebox from you uh, in your car. I hope you're not driving, by the way. I hope your parents drive you here. Well, I also want you to be a part of what is going on at Journeys Crossing and Kids Church. So next Sunday, we'll be back here on Facebook and on YouTube with a digital Kids Church experience, but we're also meeting live at 11.15 here at the building, and I want to invite you to be a part of that. You can register at I Love This Church 
facebook.com slash events. Uh, we are here in the spot. I, I'm, in, I'm in the recording studio right now, but out there is the spot. We're here and we're staying distance from each other. We're wearing masks. We have sanitizer. We have all of the safety protocols covered. We're dismissing you. So with that being said, I love you guys. I hope you had a whole lot of fun watching me in a taco costume. I hope you had a lot of fun wearing your costumes. I hope you have a nice pile of candy to eat today. I will see you later. Bye-bye. Oh, I'm doing yeah.